Hi, welcome to 938 Online. My name is Mark Lucenius and I'm the lead pastor for 938 Church. And welcome back, welcome home. Uh, we're finishing up our homecoming series. I wanna share with you just something very cool going on that uh, we get to be a part of and you might be able to get to be a part of as well. Uh, we know that a lot of people suffered a lot of damage from Hurricane Ida just a few weeks back and it devastated communities and many, many homes. And the county has been trying to rally resources in order to address the many, many particular needs because uh, this could create a, a tremendous homeless population challenge if not addressed rightly. And so they reached out to a community of churches in our area to see if they can help specific families get through the challenges left behind by Hurricane Ida. And we're gonna be a part of that. In fact, we adopted a family in Malvern. And in the next few weeks, we are gonna get the opportunity to help some folks who, man, they experienced something that none of us would want to experience for ourselves. And we get to be able to extend some grace from the grace that God has shown us. Isn't that cool? Uh, we're really excited about that. It's always great to have the opportunity to invest more and more in the community. Now, you're gonna find that as we go through our gathering, there's going to be a theme of party uh, going on within the message, but just within the life of our church. This past week, after our uh, gathering, we celebrated Tailgate Sunday. In a few weeks, we're gonna have another opportunity to bring people together. We want you to be a part of it called Pumpkin Derby Fest. And it's going to be 11 o'clock right after our in-person gathering in Uptown. And we're gonna do a variety of ways, a variety of things just to have a bunch of fun with our folks, including the Great Pumpkin Push because of the Great, the great Pumpkin Derby this year is going to be a pumpkin push. Uh, there's gonna be other different games. And new this year, we're going to have the Greatest Gourd. And so you're gonna have the opportunity to present a decorated gourd. You can pick, you can go buy whatever gourd you want and decorate it however you want it to be to make it the greatest gourd. And if you win, we're gonna have like 
a really awesome prize and a blue ribbon for the winner. So, and you get to present your greatest gourd and everyone there is gonna vote on what the greatest gourd is going to be. So, hey, don't miss Pumpkin Derby Fest and maybe even bring your greatest gourd. It's gonna be on October 17th. 11 o'clock right after the in-person gathering. Also, speaking of parties, uh, this past week we had our first introductory gathering for Rooted, which is an opportunity to build friendships and grow your faith. It's a 10-week course that we are going through at Market Street Grill every Wednesday from 6.30 to 8. So if you're interested in meeting some folks and growing your faith, it's a great place to start. You can email info at 938.church to find out more. Now, uh, as a church, uh, we are celebrating baptisms today, and we realize that there's a baptism that you might not have been able to experience if you've only been with us online. So uh, today, I'd like to read for you Ryan Grieco's baptism testimony and let you watch it. This happened on Easter Sunday this past year, but we haven't celebrated this at 9.30 online yet. So uh, Ryan's story goes like this. Hi, my name is Ryan Greco, and today I have decided to get baptized. I mean, I know I already have done it, like when my parents did when I was a baby, but that was really their decision because I couldn't even talk yet. Before, when I was younger, I thought I had to take this step at a certain age, but I don't believe that anymore. Baptism is a way to tell others that you believe through your actions, and that can happen at any age. In fact, my mom and dad said they were much older when they made that decision. Really, it's about telling others that you want to devote your life to Christ. When my mom asked me why someone gets baptized, I told her, anyone that believes and wants to grow more in their relationship with God and be part of the church family. I used to think it was this thing that I had to do, like going to school or going to bed with my parents tell me. But I, now I see that baptism is something I don't have to do, but I get to choose to do because it is my decision. I know that God wants everyone to come to him, but honestly, I thought maybe I was too young to get baptized. I thought I might have to come to know more, be older, and have no questions or doubts. But baptism isn't, baptism isn't about what age you are or having it all figured out. It's about believing that Jesus died for us and that he saved us from our sins. It's about letting him make my choices in life and following his leadership. I've been learning sometimes following Jesus means I have to get out of my comfort zone. Baptism is one of those things for me. It's hard to want to do something where everyone is going to be staring at me as I get dunked in the water. Uh, during the pandemic this last year, I feel like I got closer to Christ during online church because I was, was not so distracted by my friends and stuff. I actually listened more and started to understand more. I also really liked our time as a family doing the D6 Magazine devotionals. One that really helped me was a story about the transfiguration. It was when Jesus was showing Peter and John that he was God, and Peter didn't get it. Here's Peter, one of Jesus' closest disciples, and he was clueless about what was going on. That was comforting to me because I realized I'm not always going to understand everything. But I've learned that faith is believing in something even when you don't fully understand everything. For example, there's this bridge drawing I've seen done a couple of times in my life, but it never really made sense before. Then during the message about Jonah, I remember Pastor Mark had this whiteboard and was in his basement drawing the bridge again. And it finally just made sense. I understood that we aren't perfect and that I don't have to be. I finally saw that when Jesus died on the cross, he filled in that gap and made a way to walk over. Believing in Jesus is the way or the bridge to God for all of eternity. Two Sundays ago when I listened to the sermon, I heard Rachel say, he has to lose for us. I'm sorry. He has to lose for us to win. This was a powerful example for me because I love sports and winning. And when she said it's like the March Madness championship game and he chose to forfeit the game so we could win, it totally made sense. He had to die for us to be in heaven with him. I thought, wow. It's like one team is, is God and the other team is us. And God chose to lose and forfeit everything so that we can win. But really, in the big picture, we are both winners. At the end of the message, when it, when it talked about baptism, my parents asked me if I ever thought about it, and I told them, yes, I am ready. 
So here I am. Ryan, do you accept Jesus as your Lord and trust him as a leader of your life? Yes. All right, for that reason, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. When we celebrate baptism, we remind ourselves that there is a party in heaven. There's a party in heaven every time someone finds their way back to God. That's what we celebrate as a church. And Ryan, way to go. We cheer you on. Big, big cheers for Ryan. Anyway, well, hey, with that, um, let me turn it over to Rachel. She's got another party story for you, and I'll see you afterwards. the medicine the only cure for everything I feel within redeeming what was lost and all that could have been oh this is a healing kind of love you are the true Staying through the night when I was at my end Comforting my heart till it was light again Oh, this is a faithful kind of love An everlasting Father, bring When every page will turn So I will trust your timing I will rest secure Oh, this is a steady kind of love An everlasting Father Prince of Peace Emmanuel God Yeah.
Hey, it's great to be with you. I'm Rachel Short. I'm the pastor of Community Life here, and we are wrapping up our last week of a series called Homecoming. And it is always really interesting naming things as a church. If you have been around the Christian community for any length of time, then you may know that Christians use some interesting words when they are trying to name things. You just take a look at the popular Christian conferences that are named things like Summit or Exponential or Catalyst. I had a friend text me a few weeks ago and asked me if I was going to Spire. And I was like, what is Spire? I mean, this is getting out of control, guys. But um, it's so funny because a few years ago, we were really struggling to know what we should name our leader training. And so we were coming up with all of these different terms. Should we call it equip? Should we call it develop? Should we call it apprentice? What should we call it? And then one day Mark was just like, what if we just call it 938 leader training? And we were like, that's a genius idea. How about we actually call it 938 leader training? That's what it is. And so when we were coming up with what is the word that we want to call this new series, this series on Luke 15, this series of the story of the prodigal son, we came up with the word homecoming. But even still, we had some reservations about it because frankly, the term homecoming coming and the term home can conjure up a mix of emotions for different people because depending on our upbringing, home is not necessarily a place that always has a joyful memory or a joyful feeling. It was interesting because several years ago, Pew Research came out with a study asking 2,200 Americans how they would describe their home. But they asked it in such a way, they asked the question in such a way of, of, of saying the place, describe the place in your heart you consider to be home. And people answered that in a variety of ways. Some people described home as the place that they live currently. Some people described home as the place that they were born and raised. Other people described home as the place they had lived the longest. And some people described their home as the place they went to high school, the place in your heart you consider to be home can be a lot of different places. And throughout this homecoming series, we've been looking at this conversation Jesus has with the Pharisees and the scribes who have really been giving him grief about associating with the tax collectors and sinners. And so Jesus, in response to these grumblings, tells not one, not two, but three stories. He tells a story of a shepherd 
who had lost his sheep and he goes and he leaves the 99 and goes to search for the one. And then when he finds the sheep, he puts it over his shoulders and he comes back and he gathers his friends and neighbors and he celebrates that he had found the sheep. And then the second story he shares is a story of a woman who had lost a coin and so she sweeps through her whole house and finally finds this coin. And once she finds it, she tells her friends and her neighbors that she's found this coin. And then she, she gathers them together to do a celebration. And then finally, Jesus tells the third story. And this is where he tells a story about this concept of home, a home, the place that our heart should consider home to be. And what's interesting is when he starts telling the third story, he starts off with almost cueing the audience with a distinct detail that wasn't in the other stories. See, the first story, it was one shepherd who had lost one sheep. And the second story, it was one woman who had lost one coin. And then the third story he starts to tell is that there is a father, one father, who had two sons. And it's almost as if Jesus is telling us to lean in because this is the culmination of the story. He's cueing the audience to ask ourselves the question of what is going to happen to these two sons. And so we've been unpacking this story the past several weeks and been telling the different perspectives. And so let's recap Luke chapter 15, that there is one son who one day comes to his father and asks for his share of the inheritance early. And so the father divides the property between his younger son and his older son. And the younger son takes his inheritance a few days later and goes off and squanders all of his wealth on lavish living, on reckless living. And um, one day as he is sitting in a pig pen in starvation, he is, thinks to himself, you know, at my father's house, my, the servants in my father's home live better than I am living right now. And so I am going to go to my father and I'm going to tell him that I have sinned against him and I have sinned against heaven. I'm no longer worthy to be his son. And so I'm going to ask him to hire me as one of his servants. And the story goes that as the younger son is approaching the house, the father sees him a long way off because he has been looking for him. And he runs to him and he embraces him. And the younger brother starts to share his speech. And then the father cuts him off and says, no, tell the servants, tell the servants to get the, the party ready, to grab the best robe, to put sandals on his feet, to kill the fattened calf because the son of mine was lost and is now found. He was dead. He is now alive. And they began to celebrate. And this is the story that we know. And whether you grew up in church, you may have heard a little bit of this story. And we, we tend to kind of stop in this moment and we think to ourselves, man, that this is, this is a, a unique lesson that Jesus is telling the Pharisees, that he's telling them that, man, look at the father's compassion for the younger son. He's telling them, look at the forgiveness the, uh, the, the father offers to the son. Look at the way the father celebrates his homecoming. But if we just stop right here, we forget that there is much more to the story. And that the first part of the story where Jesus had cued the Pharisees, the distinction is meant to be focused on that. The father had two sons and there is another character in the story. And if we overlook him, we miss Jesus's invitation to a celebration, a celebration that we are meant to be a part of. So starting in verse 25, we see what has been going on with the older brother. Meanwhile, the older brother was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. 
So he called one of his servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all of these years I have been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So this story includes two sons, and what's interesting is that we see that the one who has been on the outside is now on the inside, and the one who has been on the inside is now on the outside. And so we have to ask ourselves these questions of why is the brother on the outside? Why does he stay outside? and how the father invites him inside, and then why this invitation is meant to matter to us, why this invitation to a celebration matters to us. Now, if you're like me, you are reading this exchange and you're hearing the older brother share this speech with the father and you find yourself being like, yeah, yeah, that is so unfair. He doesn't get a party? Like, he doesn't get thrown a party? I mean, he doesn't get the fattened calf killed for him? That's so unfair. And so, but then you have to think to the question, okay, why is it? Why is it that he doesn't even go inside when he hears music? Does he even know that this has to do with his brother? But he finds himself stopping in his tracks because obviously there's something deeper going on here. There is a reason his heart does not want to be inside the home. And Jesus begins to shed light on these questions. When the older brother um, calls the servant, I just picture this happening this way, that the servant kind of approaches him and is like, bro, get you some of this fattened calf. Like your dad is throwing this party. It is awesome. Take some of that piece. Get, get some of that piece right there. You know, and so it's like, and then that only infuriates him even more. It just makes it worse. The older brother just gets so angry because obviously there is something going on in his heart. There's something that's making him upset. And so we see as the father, when the father comes out to plead with him, the first thing is he says, he says, look, all these years I've been slaving for you. Whew slaving for you. Okay, so the older brother is has put the father in a, a position as like a master and he is a servant. And you find yourself asking, man, like where did that come from? That he is suddenly this servant? But we have to understand a little bit of the context in order to be able to understand where the older brother is coming from. So in biblical times, the firstborn has great privilege great privilege. So we see in Genesis 27 that Esau is meant to be, who is the firstborn, is meant to be given the birthright blessing. We see that Leah is given a first in marriage over her younger sister, Rachel. We see that the greatest disaster that God brought to Egypt was the disaster of killing all of the firstborn 
firstborn children, it was custom that the child, the firstborn child, was to receive double inheritance. And in my family, my brother reminds me often that he is the firstborn male heir. And so isn't that nice? That's a good reminder that I need, need to remember daily. So anyway, it's important for us to remember that the older brother's life, the whole, his whole life, he has been groomed to perform. He has been groomed to have this picture of what his life is going to look like, how his, all of his work is going to pay off, that he's going to clock in the hours and receive great reward. And you wonder if his whole life people had made comments on him, like, look at Johnny out there. Johnny just working out in the field. He's always given extra time, you know, always given those extra hours. You know, or you wonder if all of the village moms kind of got together and kind of talked to their daughters and were like, you see Johnny? Yep, marriage material, ladies, marriage material, okay? And so he was this model son. But it's in this moment that we see this moment outside, what's really going on with him inside. His heart is exposed. His heart is far from home. His heart wants the credit. His heart wants the recognition. His heart is filled with pride. His heart wants the party to be about him. Can you relate? I know I can. He goes on talking to his dad saying um, that he has been slaving for him, that he has never disobeyed. I've never disobeyed you, never, and you never even gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, doesn't even call him his brother, this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. So here, the brother's angle is to compare and contrast his life versus his, his younger brother's life, which, you know, is always a pretty good tactic because we typically can find someone else who it looks worse than we, are, we do, right? And so he's basically saying, look at my life compared to his life and who's getting the party? I'm just confused. So, um, so the older brother is saying that the younger brother, he's getting the fattened calf. And in that day, the fattened calf was only brought out for these exuberant celebrations, these parties of like, 200 people. And the, and the um, older brother is saying, you haven't even given me a goat, which the goat signifies sin because goats were, pre were predominantly used in atonement sacrifices. And so he is clearly upset. Many of us, if we are honest, we can relate. Maybe we're not uh, like the Pharisees, and we would never say the word unclean when describing the tax collectors and sinners. But um, we would look at other people and think that they, they don't really deserve the gifts that they have been given. You know, why did they get the promotion? Why do they have more followers on social media? Why do they earn a better living? Why do they have grandkids? Why do they have a better marriage? Why do they have a marriage? Whatever it is, it's so unfair. It's so unfair. Have you been there? I know I have. On the outside looking in, there's a party going on inside. There's a homecoming party going on inside. And on the outside, there's a pity party. Jesus says in Mark 7:20. Out of the heart of man comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. These evil things come from within and they defile a person. It's not the good deeds. It's not the hard work that's keeping him on the outside. It's what's happening on the inside. His heart keeps him on the outside. Now, if you're like me, you really connect with the older brother. I know he has pride. I know he has envy. I know his heart is not in the right place. 
But I do find myself asking, doesn't he deserve a party? Doesn't he deserve a celebration? And this is when we see Jesus tell the story of the Father's invitation, the Father inviting him inside. Now remember, the Father has just left As he approaches the sun, he has left the music and dancing. He has left the 200 people. He has left the fattened calf. That is oh so good. He has left the party because there's someone really important to him who is missing. He doesn't have just one son. He has two. And he goes to him and he says, My son, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. Now, when I first read this, sometimes the question that comes through my head is, is is he talking figuratively? Is he talking metaphorically? Or, Or what is he really saying here? But we know that the Father is talking literally in this instance because everything the Father has is going to the older brother. Everything he has is going to the older brother. The younger brother squandered his portion. Everything is going to the older son. And the father is inviting him to leave his work behind, to leave his pride behind, to leave his envy behind, and to exchange his labor for joy. At home with the father is where the heart belongs. It's where the party is. It's where the love of the father is. That's why the scripture says that we have been given everything that we need for life and godliness. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God has given you everything, that he wants to give you every good gift? This is Jesus' invitation to the Pharisees, that everything the Father has, they have access to I have a um, three-year-old cousin, Hardy, whose favorite game to play is hide and seek. Now, Hardy has two older siblings who are just a couple years older. And on Labor Day weekend, I got to spend some time with them in Texas. And so there was this game, hide and seek, going on uh, throughout the weekend. And it was my turn to play the game. And I did not know how, quite how long this game was going to last. But I said yes to the game. And I learned that there are very specific rules to how you play hide and seek. And so the person who is counting not only has to close their eyes, but their hands have to be over their eyes at all times because if they are tempted to open their eyes, the hands are there to protect them. So there's no peeking. So that has to happen. And also when you are counting to 50, there has to be a particular cadence to the count. It can't just be like one, two, three, four, five. I mean, it's like one, 1,000, two, 1,000, three, 1,000. So so about 30 minutes later, you get to 50. So I was playing this game with Hardy and his brother and sister, and um, I learned very quickly that Hardy does not quite understand the purpose of hide and seek. So I uh, count to 50, and Hardy would immediately jump up wherever he is and say, come find me first. And I would explain to him, Hardy, that this is actually not, you don't want to be found. Like that you actually want to stay hiding because you win as you you stay hiding. So, so we went over this like several times. Okay. Um, But you know, uh, about the fourth time I learned that Hardy actually had a better strategy. (laughs) because Hardy understood that if I found him first, then he would get to go with me to go find his brother and his sisters, okay? And that was just so much fun, okay? Because when you find them, then there's just like this joyful, like, got you, or there you are, you know? And so it's like, it's way, way, way more fun. And, um, you know, 
it was in that moment that I was thinking about the fact that, man, it is so much better to be found. It's so much better to be found that Jesus is telling the Pharisees that this is the lesson that we are meant to be found that we are meant to be found, that Jesus is saying that he wants to come with us, that he's coming with us to go find his sibling. And that's what the father is saying. The father is saying this to the older brother. He's saying, I want you in the party. I want you to be here. I miss you when you're not here. And that's what Jesus is saying to you. That's what he's saying to me. That's what he's saying to the Pharisees is that it is so much better to be found. It's so much better to be found that Jesus is the true older brother, that we don't have to be the one who performs our way to his love, that we never can do it on our own, that we, we can't do it on our own, that we are meant to leave the field and be, and be found in the safety of the Father, that that is where we belong. That is where our heart belongs. That is where our heart considers home, is with the Father. In the Old Testament, God speaks through the prophet Ezekiel, and he says to the nation of Israel, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Jesus is the way to the Father. He is the one who changes our hearts. He is the one who gives us a heart of flesh. Today at our in-person gathering, we are celebrating baptisms, and these are sons and daughters of God who are choosing to come inside the party. They are choosing to celebrate. They are choosing um, to accept the invitation, and that's how Jesus leaves and finishes the story. As he leaves it open-ended, he leaves it up to us, is will we accept the invitation? Have you accepted it? Have you accepted the invitation? Have you entered in the celebration? Have you entered in to the joy of the Lord? That's where you and I belong. That's where he wants us. Let's pray. Father, I too often have been outside looking in. I have been the one outside um, wanting the recognition. I have been outside in pride. I've been outside in envy. And we praise you that you are a God who comes and finds us, um, that you are a God who comes looking for us. And so, God, I ask for Whoever is listening who um, may still be waiting to be found, God, and they may need your help going into the party, God, we ask, Lord, that they would say, come find me. God, that they would say, would you um, change my heart of stone and turn it into a heart of flesh? Only you can change our hearts. And so, Jesus, we ask that you would do that today. In your name we pray. Amen. It is so much better to be found, isn't it? It's so much better. I, I, that wrecks my heart to think how often I've been that older brother that doesn't want to step into the joy um, that God offers me. Um, but to see that um, and to be reminded that uh, not only does he v value and want the younger son to be found, but when I'm that older son, well, he'll come out after me as well. It's so much better to be found. Well, I hope you find yourself found and known by the Lord and uh, just filled with the joy of being a part of his celebration, being a part of his party, being a part of his kingdom and his goodness. And I hope that's true for you and hope that continues to be true. Uh, a couple ways to continue on the part is you can join Rooted. Uh, with us. If you'd like to learn more about our 938 Church, we do have something every week called 938 Connect, and you might not be in person with us, but we'll still do that virtually. Just email info at 938.church and just say, hey, uh, I'm signing up for the digital 938 Connect, and someone will get back to you, and we'll just meet with you right online and tell you all about 938. There's a lot of different ways to continue the party.
You can join us in person, keep joining us online. Uh, we have groups that meet every single week. Uh, we're going to be having Pumpkin Derby Fest. All of these are ways that we can continue to come together. It is good to be together. Have a great week.